Thank you, Brother Holland. It certainly is a pleasure to be here and to be before you again. This is my first trip into this section of Ohio. I came here to um, return from Parkersburg because the runway had fallen in, and I had to come up here in order to get a plane. I would like to join, in fact, I'd like to endorse what Brother Holland said about the school in Cookville. One of our young men who grew up at uh, Gedwell, who's graduating from Fried Hardeman, was at our services yesterday. He's already preaching. And he is coming there to the graduate school unless I can persuade him to go to Cookville, and that's what I've been trying to do. Because I really think what Brother Holland said about the school there is, is true. And then I believe what Brother Warren said about the school here is true. And so I can be like the little boy who grew tired uh, of praying, supposedly, and wrote his prayers out and uh, wrote it up and put it on the head of the bed and would point to it and say, Lord, them's my sentiments. <laughs> Those are my sentiments. Brother Warren and I have worked together very closely for into the seventh year. Now, I don't know whether we've had our seven lean years or our seven fat years, but it's been very pleasant. Brother Warren is a man of remarkable ability, but he's a man of character that is just as great as his ability. And certainly, you're fortunate to have him and these other men that have been mentioned here before. Now, tonight we're discussing an emotional issue, but a real issue, a live issue, and one that is calculated to be one of the big problems, and not to be, it is one of the big problems facing us. And you know, brethren, I really believe that we have seen only the tip of the iceberg. Now, almost everybody has somebody within his family, or within the congregation, or certainly among his friends that are involved at least by implication, in some of these matters. But you know it does not change it if it's within my family, or if I be the one that might be involved. That doesn't change it at all. In other words, it is what does the Bible say? In 1 Peter 4.11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion now and forever. Amen. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, applies not only in primary obedience, but in all areas, in all facets of our relationship to the Lord. I'm going to use some transparencies with the help of a brother tonight, so I hate for you to look away from me, but then uh, I think they'll be on this uh, wall over here. And while we're ready for the first one, I want to begin with a question of what is marriage? Now, whatever marriage is, whatever the Bible authorizes, is marriage is what, uh, what we want, of course. First, it is a covenant which establishes a home. In Malachi 2.14, yet you say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, now note this part, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Notice the wife is the companion. Before people marry, it seems that sometimes at least uh, the man will lift the wife over a match head or a toothpick, doesn't want the little delicate thing to get hurt. And then after they've been married for 15 or 20 years with eight or 10 children, one out under each arm will allow her to climb a 10 rail fence and yell, come on, slowpoke, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Yet is she thy companion? Brother Guy in Woods was visiting in Palestine, or told about a man visiting in Palestine, an American, he saw an Arab going down the street riding a donkey, and behind him, his wife and children. In this case, I suppose he had only one. And so the American asked what was a perfectly logical question, he thought. He said, why is your wife not riding? And the Arab gave what he thought was a logical answer, I suppose. He said, because she ain't got no donkey. <laughs> I think that'd be a pretty logical explanation. But she is thy companion. But notice, and yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. You remember in Matthew 19, 3 through 9, and there came Pharisees unto him, and trying him and saying, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Both without and within today, we have people who are just about to take that position, and some of them I suppose have. And he answered and said, Have ye not read? If we could just get people to read and believe what they read, rightly divided, it wouldn't be difficult at all. It's these emotional things often that enter into it. Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? 
and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now you'll notice he said he made them male and female. I was in London in 1967 and going down Piccadilly Street and some of those streets and the wind was blowing and walking along behind boys and girls, men and women, especially young men and women, hair flowing in the breeze. There are times I couldn't tell whether I was walking behind a, a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. And I told my wife and daughters when I returned, I said, that will come to America. And indeed it has. I heard of a preacher who was performing a ceremony for two hippies and he became so confused that they said at the end, he said, will one of you please kiss the bride? <laughs> now the Lord made us male and female. And I'll tell you one of the fastest ways to get a fight out of a little boy when I was growing up was to call him a sissy. I don't know why a man would want to be a woman, nor why a woman would want to be a man. But what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why then did Moses command to give a bill of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, for your hardness of heart, suffer you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it hath not been so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now then look again. It is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant which establishes a home. It is more than a civil contract. Now, I was brought up on the philosophy, which I believe to be the truth, that a man's word should be his bond. I once kept several thousands of dollars overnight for a man in Oak Ridge because he had sold his house. He had moved there in anticipation of buying a house and bringing his family, and he was staying in a dormitory. He said, I don't trust the people here. I said, well, what if someone breaks into my house and steals it? He said, well, he would still rather I keep it. I kept it. Now, I, I had an obligation to this man. But if it even be a civil contract, I know Galatians 3.15 is speaking of the law and of the covenant that was made to Abraham prior to the law, but the principle applies in everything wherein a child of God is involved. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet when it hath been confirmed, no man maketh it void or addeth. There too. If marriage were no more than a civil contract, and it's far more than that because God is witness to this. But the way some people treat marriage, it would be treated in a dishonorable fashion if it were nothing more than a civil contract. Well, again, marriage is the permanent union of two personalities. That's what God intends. Two personalities under God's law and before men. Matthew 19, 1 through 9, Romans 7, 2 and 3 teaches this as well as other passages. And then finally, marriage is the application of the golden rule to a very intimate and tender relationship. You know, in Matthew 7, 12, it says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would, you know, we sometimes have it worded, do unto men or others as they do unto you. Well, that is not what that passage says. Some people mistreat you. You're not to mistreat them. Therefore, whatsoever you would that men, and that's the key, you would that men should do to you, do even so unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. I heard of a couple who had grown quite elderly, and the gentleman decided that he had not been as tender and, and thoughtful of his wife as he should have been. So he decided that he at least would try to make amends. And so that evening, they were sitting around the fire, and he said, Ma, I am proud of you. She said, eh? He said, I'm proud of you. She said, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> well, we are to have a tender, intimate relationship in marriage. Could we have the next one then? Notice now, happy marriage, and I don't have time really to cite passages on this because my plane leaves at 10 and I don't want this preacher to go over time. But a happy marriage is a result of preparation an awareness of the sacredness of marriage, a result of proper parental and children education. I heard Brother Hardiman say this once, and I've thought about it a great deal. He said when he was a young man, he preached on the great mistakes of Noah, how Noah was such a failure that he didn't convert anybody outside his family. And he said an old brother took him out behind the house, not wanting to embarrass him. He said, young man, don't ever make that charge against Noah again. For he said, remember that Noah saved all of his family, and if everybody were that successful in those days, there would have been no flood. 
I've often said to my wife, if we could be successful in rearing good children, if we could do nothing more, and normally you'll do more than that, but if you could do nothing more, then I believe that we could have lived a life that would make a contribution to the world. I really believe that. I've often said, as our children were growing up, we have three daughters, all of our boys were girls, but I've often said to my wife as we were growing up, it won't be long until all we'll have will be empty rooms, dusty toys, and precious memories. And we must put a lot of training into these children, for the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so therefore, we want to properly educate both ourselves and our children. We must properly handle financial affairs, and this kind of preparation conduct will help and not hinder each other's eternal welfare. Could we have the next one then? Now, I'm not going to take the time to cite passages which could easily be put, many passages, to all of these, but we need to try to save marriages. That's the best and proper thing to do even before they get into trouble. Licentious literature, obscene and filthy shows on TV, lascivious movies, obvious lures, the modern dance. You used to hear a lot of preaching against the dance. I don't hear much anymore, but it's just as sinful as it ever was. Music that appeals to base emotion. So much of that is true today. Smoking, drinking, dope, filthy speech, necking parties, others could be added. We need to teach people to think upon things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. And then the following verse identifies what will follow. The things Paul said, which you both learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do, and the God of peace shall be with you. You create a revolution in a man's thinking, and you'll create a revolution in a man's action. But the next one, if you will. Now then, to the subject of marriage and divorce, who can marry scripturally? Well, those who have never been married. 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. Paul said, but I say to the unmarried... And to widows, it is good for them if they abide, even as I. But if they have not continency, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So if a person has never been married, provided they marry an eligible partner, they have a right to be married. Or if their companion is dead, they have a right then to remarry. And those who have been married previously, but whose former companion was guilty of fornication. Passage I've cited a time or two in Matthew 19:9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. The innocent person, if a man is absolutely innocent, his wife absolutely guilty of immorality, he did not contribute at all to it, he has a right to remarry. And the opposite would be true in the case of a guilty husband and a, the innocent wife. And then those who have been married, but whose companion is dead. In Romans 7, 2, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. I heard somebody say that a man's wife, uh, so he thought, died. But it turned out she was only in a deep coma. And they were taking her to bury her and going through a grassy lot, which I've had uh, gone to some of those places for funerals. And uh, they, the pallbearers, some of them slipped and fell, and they heard a movement and realized that she was alive and took her back, and she lived several days, even a few weeks. And they took her again. They thought she had died this time for sure, and they took her back. And when they got to that wet spot, they said her husband said, Be careful, boys. <laughs> but you see, the point of it is this. The point of it is this. When dead, he had a right to remarry, provided he married an eligible partner. Now then, could we have the next one? All right, now, who cannot marry scripturally? Well, those who have a living, former companion who was not put away for fornication. You know, I didn't know that was so hard to understand until recently. I've been a member of the church since I was 12. I've heard gospel preaching. I can't even remember when I first started hearing it, and I never heard anybody teach anything differently until recently. Now, as Brother Holland talked about putting your ear to the ground and seeing which way the wind is blowing, I wonder if any of that could enter into it. Let me briefly mention a few, just a few, of the theories that are being taught. And by the way, what good will it do us, brethren, if we save the church from doctrinal corruption, liberalism, doctrinally, 
But at the same time, we let the guards down and the fellowship of the church is filled with adulterers. Now what good will it do? What diff the devil doesn't care which way he gets the church. He just as soon to get the church on the immoral route as he had on the doctrinal corruption. And it makes no difference how pious a man may act when he preaches some of these theories. They're still false theories. And incidentally, before I go to them, let me make mention of this. These problems have been problems that have surfaced more strongly at times than others, but they've been problems many, many times. They were problems in the first century. You remember, and Brother Warren made mention of the fact that time could come when we would be faced with a life and death situation if we say we're Christians. The church in Pergamum was a fine congregation in many, many ways, but they had a real problem with adultery. Some of them did. You remember the Lord said through John in Revelation 2, 12 through, well, about 14 ends that particular discussion of that phase of it. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These things saith he that hath the sharp two-edged sword. I know where thou dwellest, even where Satan's throne is. And thou holdest fast my name and didst not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, Brother Antipas is the kind of man we need today. He would die before he would compromise. But even in that great congregation, they had a problem with adultery. In verse 14, beginning, it says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast some there that hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak. Well, what was that teaching? And I wish I had time to go into detail on the story of Balaam, which I obviously do not. Who taught uh, Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication? And in the next verse it says, So hast thou also some that hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans in like manner. I heard somebody talking about the teaching of the Nicolaitans and they said that the Nicolaitans were those who threw nickels into the contribution. Well, I don't believe that's what it was talking about. They were people who uh, taught Oh, idolatry and uh, adultery, from the best I can gather, from what I've read about it, were matters of indifference. That Christianity gave you license to sin. You know, Paul talked about such men in Jude 4. He said, for there are certain men crept in privily, coming from a word that means to creep in by the side door, and that's the way the devil normally does it. He crept in by the side door and coffee cut people into antiism. That's what he normally does. He doesn't come out and tell you what he's going to do. But he said, even they who were of old written beforehand under this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Paul dealt with that same kind of sin in Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Perish the thought. But we have people even in the church today who are basically teaching that kind of doctrine. Now then, with that in mind, though, in the Pergamum congregation they had, but they also had it in the Thyatira congregation. I won't take the time to call attention to what precedes it, but in verse 20, But I have this against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, and she teacheth and seduceth my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. But I think the next verse is especially significant. And I gave her time that she should repent of her fornication, and she will, that she should repent, and she willeth not to repent of her fornication. You know, the Lord even wanted Jezebel to be saved, didn't he? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I gave her time that she should repent, and she willeth not to repent of her fornication. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, making a play here, the fact that she loved the bed of immorality. He said, I'll really cast her into a bed. Behold, I cast her into a bed, and them to commit fornication with her into great tribulation. Notice this part, except they repent of her works. You know, the Bible does not say if the blind lead the blind, the blind leaders will fall into the ditch. It says they both shall fall into the ditch. Now, some of these men today who are leading others have tremendous responsibilities. My brethren, be not many of you teachers knowing that you shall receive the heavier condemnation. 
James 3. But if you follow these errors, that does not exclude you from falling into the ditch either. You have a Bible, you have an obligation to study it. He said, Behold, I will kill her children with death. And what will the churches know from this? And all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto each one of you according to your works. It was a problem then, but God did not endorse it, and he doesn't endorse it tonight. Now back to the point I was about to make. What are some of these views? Well, on the outside we have all kinds of views, so I'm not going to deal with them since time is so limited. There's a brother out in Oklahoma, and nearly all these fellows feel compelled to write a book or to have a debate and get it in a book form. There's a brother out there that's taken the position that the guilty has the same right to remarry as the innocent. Well, if that's true, you talk about putting a premium on sin, having your cake and eating it too. When Paul said they were slanderously accused of saying, let us do evil that good may come, if that fellow's right, Paul was wrong, but Paul was not wrong. And then there's another man who has, uh, preaches for a large college congregation, and he has his book out. And he says that 1 Corinthians 7:15 countermands. That would mean to revoke or set aside this passage over here in Matthew 19. 9. I don't believe a word of it. Matthew 19:9 still says exactly what it ought. Can you imagine even a denominational preacher coming right out and being bold enough to say one passage revokes another? I know some of them must believe that. But imagine a man saying that. And then there is another view that says, and this man has twice defended this false view publicly with faithful brethren. He says that it is scriptural, that one can be unscripturally divorced and unscripturally remarried, and he can stay in that situation without further sin. That is, with God's approval. Now let's think of that a moment or two. Suppose that you might say a man can be unscripturally baptized. It's really not a baptism, but sprinkled and poured. And he can stay in that unscriptural relationship, whatever denomination that put him into, and do that with God's approval and without further sin. Can you imagine anybody advocating such a view? Now, the man would say, perhaps, that's different, but I'd like for him to show where it's different. I've talked with a number of Christian church preachers and discussed with them, and when I would ask them, do you bury or sprinkle or pour? They've all said, do we bury some of them are so liberal now, they would sprinkle the poor, but the ones I've talked with said they would, they bury. I've asked, well, why do you do that? The Bible does not say, thou shalt not sprinkle the poor. They say, oh, it says a burial, and that excludes sprinkling in poor. Well, I always say then, you know, the Bible says sing, and so that excludes instrumental music. They say, oh, that's different, but I've never found one yet who could show where it's different. Now, listen, if you can be unscripturally divorced and unscripturally married and stay in that unscriptural, Situation, that's what it amounts to. Why can't you be unscripturally baptized and stay in that unscriptural baptism with God's approval? But here's another. Now we have another uh, man who's been a great man in the cause of the Lord, and I have no ill will toward anybody. But I don't think you had me up here to talk in generalities. Paul said, having therefore such a hope, we use great plainness of speech, 2 Corinthians 3 and in verse 12. Another man who's been a great fighter against doctrinal liberalism, done tremendous good, but now says Matthew 19, 9 applies only to the members of the church. A covenant passage. So he says. Now, Brother E.C. Fuquay took the position a few years ago that the alien center was bound only by the civil law. This latter view that I'm now mentioning is only a modification of that, but I haven't found anybody in years who say they believe Brother Fuqua's position, but a lot of them do, you can tell by the arguments. I think Brother Warren did such an outstanding job in that debate that there are people who don't want, don't want to admit they hold to it, but you watch the reasoning and see. But uh, according to this man, he says, and then I'll talk just a little bit about uh, the Fuqua position, but uh, he says that this is a covenant passage. And it tries to connect 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. But unto the married I give charge, Paul said, yea, not I, but the Lord, that the wife depart not from her husband. But should she depart, let her remain unmarried, or else be reconciled to her, to her husband. 
And that the husband leave not his wife. Now I raise the question. Paul said, but unto the married I give charge. Yea, not I, but the Lord. Now tell me what the Lord said about it up here in Matthew 19, 9. You know, the Lord used the word whosoever. And I say unto you, whosoever. Marriage applies both to the saint and to the sinner. You know, I've thought of several things along this line, and, and one of them is this. If Matthew 19, 9 just applies to the saint, to the Christian, and if you cannot use that to condemn fornication in the non-Christian, pray tell me what passage you're going to use. You certainly couldn't use Matthew 5, 28 through 30, 1 and 2, could you? Jesus said that during that same period of time. Brother Robert Taylor and I were talking about this matter this afternoon. And it certainly is something that I think many people who advocate these views have not thought about and certainly might not even advocate, but I believe it's a consequence of their doctrine. If the non-member is not bound by Matthew 19, 9, and if the believer is loose because of the desertion of the non-member, and they almost all take that position. If a person really had a yend, to live worldly, if he could marry enough non-members, and if they would desert him, if a thousand of them did, if he could live that long, why couldn't he remarry a thousand times? And that without sin. I think a lot of people haven't thought of the conclusions of these things. And then uh, furthermore, and by the way, this, this brother who's written this book, and you know, the mouth of the making of books, uh, there's no end, according to Solomon. But Solomon also said, would that my adversary, or Job did, had written a book. I had three uh, letters of correspondence with this man. He tried to array Brother Warren and I against each other and asked me a question, and when it was unsuccessful, I wrote and asked him one. And I said, now I've answered your question, and I believe honor demands you answer mine. I ask you, do you agree with the preacher there of the college church? Do you agree with the man out in Oklahoma who says the guilty can remarry? Do you agree with the man up in East Tennessee who says you can be unscripturally divorced and unscripturally remarried and stay in that condition without further sin? Will you please tell me whether you agree with that? They all have different premises to some degree, but they all come to the same unscriptural conclusions. Well, I'll tell you what that did. That stopped our correspondence. Never replied. But I think honor demanded that he reply. I replied to his question. And he's the one who instituted the correspondence. I did not. Now, brethren, what, what some of this amounts to is, do we love Lord, the Lord more than our favorite preacher? Do we love the Lord more than life itself? Do we really want to go to heaven? Well, who, who can remarry? or who cannot remarry, those who have a living form of companion who was not put away for fornication. I mentioned Brother Fuquay's position, and it won't be necessary to say much more about it, but, you know, he claimed that if you met the civil law requirements, that uh, then baptism made it a sanctified union, is what it amounted to. That specific sins were not held chargeable to alien sinners, but Paul said they were in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. He said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you charged against them while they're out here in the world. But you were washed, they were baptized. But you were sanctified, set apart by the truth. But you were justified in the name of our God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, that, I'm willing to stake the whole thing on Matthew 19.9. It doesn't make any difference what theories may be brought up. This passage will be standing when the world is on fire. And by the way, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, Jesus said in John 12, 48. But look again. Who cannot marry scripturally? Those who marry anyone who has a living former companion who was not put away for fornication. Matthew 19, 9. Now, I suspected that that would be a contrary clock here tonight, and I'd have a fight with it, and I am. So what I'm going to do now, I have four or five charts that uh, Brother Warren used in his discussion with a man on this thing, and I want to flash them up there. I don't have time, really, to read them. 
Today I used a chart that I used uh, years ago when I was in my 20s, and I made mention Brother DeHoff moderated for me in that debate. And I made mention today the chart is so new looking that you may think it hadn't been but five years ago and I couldn't be over 30. But nevertheless, be that as it may, when another brother has come up with something stated better than I stated, I don't mind using it. So let's see those next three or four, and we'll just flash them up there and look at it. I might have time to read some of them. Uh, here, of course, what the basic question that he was discussing. Here is uh, what we must answer, he says. Is it the case that all persons, whether in or out of the church, who in violating the law of Christ, specifically in divorcing and marrying again, on some ground other than fornication in violation of Matthew 19, 9, are involved in sinful practices and our states and our relationships or persons who are instructed by that law to sever, get out of, those sinful relationships? The Bible answer is yes. I've already said enough and don't have the time to go further. Let's have the next one then. All right, he mentions the answer to that basic question. That is the statement of what was his basic proposition in that particular discussion. All persons, whether in or out of the church, who in violating the law of Christ, specifically in divorcing and marrying again on some ground other than fornication, in violation of Matthew 99, are involved in sinful practices and are sinful states and are sinful relationships, are persons who are instructed by that law to cease these sinful practices, to get out of those sinful states, and to sever those sinful relationships. And I won't uh, have time to go into the other anyway, so could we have the other? This is so clear that all we need to do is to look at it. Well, I'm just going to let you read that for yourself because I want to go to 1 Corinthians 7. I want you to read it. I think you can read it very hurriedly. It's well stated. And it shows the first premise of the basic argument. And uh, I think you can read it for yourself perhaps faster than I can because I see that my time is getting away so very, very rapidly. Now, I hope that we've left it up there long enough for everybody to read them. I would recommend that you get his charts. Now then, let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, chapter 7. Now then, uh, the questions and answers and the analysis of this. First of all, the first seven verses is marriage itself right before God. Well, it is all right for one to remain single. It is all right for one to marry. Husbands and wives uh, must... Um, uh, render due benevolence to each other and be careful that they do not fraud so forth. Husband and wife should help each other to avoid temptation. Then verses 8 and 9, and I cited that passage, should widow, widow, uh, widows and widower, widowers and widows remain unmarried. Well, we gave the passage. If they have not continence, they let them marry. Then verses 10 through 11, should those who are married remain married? Now Paul says, on this matter, I give charge, yet not I, but the Lord. Now here it is, that the, a wife depart not from her husband. But if she should depart, let her do one or two things. Let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. Now there's in a case when there's no adultery involved. But I think, brethren, that in earlier years some have, al have allowed people, in this particular matter, allow people to say, oh, this is talking only about those who are in the covenant relationship. But notice Paul said, he said, but unto you, unto the married I give charge, yet not I, but the Lord. Now the Lord gave a charge that applies to all married people in Matthew 19, 9. And uh, he says you're to leave, you are to cleave. That's the teaching of the Bible. And even though he was addressing this to the church, they was talking about marriage in its universal application, whether within or without. Then could we have the next? Could you make that just a little bit plainer? Turn that just a little bit plainer. Charge number two. You'll note this, that the husband leave not his wife, and if he does, by implication is taught, let him remain unmarried, let him be reconciled to his wife. Now verses 12 and 13. Should the Christian who is married to a non-Christian leave the non-Christian? He says, but to the rest, say I, not the Lord. In other words, the Lord had not specifically dealt with this specific problem because it had not arisen. That if any brother have an unbelieving wife and she is content to dwell with him, let him not leave her. And the woman that hath an unbelieving husband and he is content to dwell with her, let her not leave her husband. All right, now that being true, he goes on to suggest this. 
He says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in the brother. Else were your children unclean, but now they're holy. And now down in verse 15, he says, yet if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God calls us in peace. Now then note, verses 14 through 16. What if the unbelieving companion departs upon his own will, upon his own middle voice? Well, Paul says, one, let him depart. Two, the brother or sister is not so bound to the unbeliever that he must give up Christ in order to hold to the unbeliever. The believer has no obligation, and never has had, to yield to pressure to give up his Christianity to preserve his marriage. And that's a very key passage. And the bondage referred to here has the uh, reference to the bondage of subjecting one to slavery rather than putting Christ first. That's the bondage that is under consideration there. Now, he points out that the believer has never been in that kind of bondage. In other words, you ought to try to save her marriage. But if it comes to the point of the unbelieving departing, then you remain faithful to the Lord in spite of the fact that your marriage, the person does not stay with you. Now the reference is to that kind of bondage and not to the fact that a deserter grants a second reason for divorce. Now you know if that is so, if desertion grants another reason, you, if the Lord had stated the whole truth on the matter, you'd have to have it read like this. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and except his wife or husband desert him, committeth adultery. And then go on with the last part of it. Matthew 19, 9 says, And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and marrieth another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Let me tell you what some of these views do. In fact, what all of them do, all of these theories are doing, they are nullifying repentance. And you know, Satan has always tried to do that. I've often used this illustration, have used it for years, and I know others have too, but I think it's a good illustration. Suppose someone comes forward tonight to be baptized, and Brother Holland asked me to do the baptizing. I asked the person to confess Christ, I cannot read his heart. He says he believes Christ is the Son of God. We go back to the baptistry and, and he changes clothes and I go on and immerse him. It wouldn't be a baptism as I'm going to describe it, but I, I put him under the water. And after he comes up out of the water, I look and uh, my watch has been gone three months and I say, well, wait a minute, you have my watch. And he says, oh, no, I don't. I stole that watch three months ago but you see, I've been baptized for mission sins, and I'm going to keep the watch and be a very faithful Christian, and I'm going to keep time on you while you preach. All right, suppose we walk outside, and uh, I naturally, I guess, would want to watch him. A man would stun me. And I, my car has been gone three months, and I watch him, and he goes and gets into my car. And I say, well, you have my car. He says, oh, no, I don't. I was baptized for mission sins. I'm going to keep the car to drive to the services. I'll be a faithful Christian. I'm going to keep the watch to keep time while you preach. I'll see you next service. But suppose as he drives away, I look more carefully, and there's my wife who's been gone three months. <laughs> And I say, now, wait a minute, you not only stole my car, my watch, and my wife, and it slows down enough to yell out of the window, says, oh, I know I stole the car and the watch and the wife, but I had been baptized for remission of sin, and I'm going to keep them all, but I'm going to be a faithful Christian. I really think I would insult your intelligence if I were to argue that much further. Now, both John the baptizer and Christ John the baptizer and Paul, rather, said we're to bring forth fruits worthy or meat for repentance. Now, by nature, I'm tender-hearted. If the Lord allowed me to make exceptions where he has not, I think I know what I would do. I know some people whose situation breaks my heart. 
But I'll guarantee you there's nobody in my family or among my closest friends who's ever heard me preach long that thinks that I would, because my relatives are there in any doubtful state, would think I would please preach less plainly. I think they'd say I preach more plainly when they're there. And it's not because I do not love them. It breaks my heart. But I'll tell you, whatever we have to give up to go to heaven is worth it, no matter what it is. And I'll tell you, brethren, the years are passing. It used to seem to me that Christmas came every two or three years, and now it comes every three or four months. Time is passing. It won't be long till all of us will be standing before the throne of God. And we'll be given an account. The Bible says in Revelation 20 and 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books, according to their works. I lived in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, more than 11 years, and when brethren asked me why I stayed so long, I said, I'm poor, and the poor you have with you always, but I stayed at least more than 11 years. And while I was there, I preached one day, and, and well, in fact, before this happened, in our Bible class, we were discussing these matters. And a sister brought up the fact that her next-door neighbor she thought was a real lady, but she found out she'd taken another woman's husband and was living with her, with him. And, of course, I never thought any more about it. I'd forgotten it was even brought up, never expected to see that woman. But I extended the Lord's invitation one day, and that woman came forward, though I did not know it. And in those days, we passed the contribution plate in the Lord's Supper before we baptized. So when the contribution plate came by Sister Fina, she wrote a note and sent it to me and said, Don't baptize this woman until I talk with you. She came back into the dressing room, and I could tell that she was perplexed and she said, that's the woman that's living with the other woman's husband. I said, well, I didn't know that. I asked her if she believed Christ was the Son of God. She said she did. All I know to do now is to basically ask her if, if she understands what's involved, if she has a right to be doing what she's doing. If she says yes, I'll baptize her. If she says no, I'm in adultery and plan to stay there, well, I won't baptize her. So she came out and I asked her and she said, I have a right to be doing this. I baptized her. That night she came to the service with a man with whom she's living, had a baby by him, and I preached on adultery. I told the elders about it. I meant to go see her on Monday, but she called me first. She said, Brother Elkins, I obeyed from the heart last night or yesterday. I knew what I was doing. I know what the Bible teaches on adultery. My father is an elder, and she named another state. She said, I have absolutely no right to be living in this man. I'm living in adultery. I know what repentance is. I obeyed from the heart. I'm going home to my daddy. And she did. Quit a good job there in Oak Ridge and went home to her daddy. Now, I did not tell her she had to do it. You know, people want, you tell me whether I have to do that. No, all I'm going to do is to tell people what the Bible said and what the Bible teaches on repentance, and then you'll have to make the application. You'll have to make the application. Let's see if we have another one of those uh, charts. And incidentally, let me give credit to Brother Roy Deaver for this splendid analysis of 1 Corinthians 7. It's one of the finest... I've seen anyway. Well, you can see that. I've already been given the signal. And on our lectureship, and by the way, this will give me an opportunity to say that the last week of October in Memphis, Tennessee, at the Gutwell uh, Church of Christ Meeting House, there will be a lectureship that will be entitled The Home as God Would Have It and Contemporary Attacks Against It. And we're going to discuss these issues. We have a lot of positive material, but we're going to discuss some of these views I've just uh, had to mention briefly here tonight. And some men are going to discuss them three and four days in succession. As we say down south, you all come. We'd like to have, and if you can't come, we want you to pray for us. Brethren, in conclusion, let me say this. The Bible says in Malachi 2.16, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. And in Colossians 3, 5 through 8, Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things say cometh the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. When you once walked, when you lived in them, shows they lived in that state while they were out in, as alien sinners. 
but now do ye also put off all these. Thank you so much. May the Lord bless you, is my prayer.